So the A and the B, I'm sure you've probably seen this before. This is a, a pretty common um, illustration. The A and the B are the exact same value. Uh, the reason that B looks so light is because it's surrounded by dark and shadow. The reason that A looks, I mean, B looks so light because it's surrounded by dark. The A block looks dark because it's surrounded by light. So you can see how that affects the value. It also affects the color. So on the left, you've got two blocks of color that are exactly the same. The one on the left looks more green because it's surrounded by the pink, which is its complement. The one on the right looks much lighter because it's surrounded by a darker color. Uh, welcome to Mastrius and today's Meet the Mentor session. My name is Louisa Mendler Johnson, and I'm a navigator at Mastrius and also the navigator for Eden's group, which will start next week on Monday, January 15th at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, which is 6 p.m. New York Time. Yes. yes. There are a few spots left, uh, so it's not too late to register. If you're new to Mastrius, you may wonder what makes it different from other online classes. Uh, it is more than a workshop. It is an ongoing mentorship with a supportive small group environment of a maximum of eight participants. It's a curated personal learning experience tailored to the participants' needs and directed by what they decide they want to do next. Uh, mentors are generous about sharing their knowledge and eager to give you the tools to develop your own style. In Masters, you will find a welcoming community of kindred spirits and a safe place to grow as an artist. Uh, each group has a navigator or a facilitator, such as myself. We are also students and learning alongside everyone else in the group, but we also serve as a guide to information about Masters, uh, as a kind of moderator or time manager in the monthly meetings with a mentor. We lead our mid-month meetings of just the group members where we discuss how things are going for us, where we want to go next with our learning experience, uh, what should possibly be tweaked. And the navigator relays this information to the mentor to make sure we're all on the same page. We also celebrate our successes, share frustrations, and find out what's new with each other. There's a wealth of information about everything to do with Masteries on the masteries.com website. If you have a specific question, don't hesitate to use the chat bot uh, that pops up as soon as you go on and somebody will get back to you in a short time. So now on to today's presentation. Uh, Eden will give you a little taste of what to expect in her mentorship in a little while, including a gouache demo that I'm personally very excited about. <laughs> But first, let me tell you a little bit about Eden's background. Um, Eden owns and operates a fine art gallery in the Arts District of Saratoga Springs in upstate New York. Her gallery is also a teaching studio where she offers private classes and a variety of workshops in pastel, oil, and gouache. Uh, Eden has been involved in art her entire life. Uh, as her grandparents were well-known artists in Texas who kept a studio in Mexico as well, where they were known to paint occasionally with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Pretty amazing. Um, she was always an avid sketcher, but she started painting professionally when she quit her advertising career in New York City and moved to the Caribbean to work as a charter chef on a private boat over 20 years ago. She and her husband ran private sailing charter boats in the Caribbean and eastern U.S. for many years before moving ashore and settling in upstate New York. Uh, Eden's formal art education began with a B.A. in art history from Colgate University and independent courses at the International Center for Photography in New York City. She has studied with many master artists in workshops and classes over the years. Her award-winning work has been included in national jury shows as well as regional and local ones. Her work can be seen in galleries in upstate New York and Boston. She's a juried member of the Degas Pastel Society, Oil Painters of America, Portrait Society of America, and an associate with distinction of the American Women Artists Association. Quite a series of accomplishments and exciting adventures, I might add. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before I hand things over. Uh, 
please uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. And um, uh, be aware that this is a recording that will be shown on the Mastria's YouTube channel. So if you're not comfortable with being on the video, feel free to uh, turn off your camera. Um, so I shall now share my screen to let you take a look at the gallery on Eden's website, and I'll let her guide you through and highlight what she wants to point out, and she'll take over from there. So welcome, Eden. Hello, I see some familiar faces. Hello, Eileen and Hi. Wendy and Trudy. And hello, everybody else who I haven't met yet. Yeah, welcome everyone else that showed up in the meantime, quite a group. <laughs> Enjoying the video? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new Mastery's videos are added. Right, okay. So um, people who are familiar with my work, or if you're not, I like to do a lot of cityscapes. Um, I always, it's just a subject matter that I come back to over and over again. And these are all a combination of gouache and oil painting. Um, there's some pastel in there. Uh, Mostly I do gouache for my unders for my for my studies. And then the larger paintings are done in oil. These uh waiter series is a restaurant in New York called Balthazar's. And uh I lived in New York for many years and it's always been one, it always reminds me of Paris. So I have basically the same references from many different years. <laughs> Every time I go there, I take the same pictures. So um, I, I do a lot of Balthazar paintings. There's also a lot of uh, Saratoga Springs cityscapes in here. So then maybe the landscapes. Uh, again, a lot of the smaller ones are gouache. I, I don't go bigger than about um, eight by eight or 10 by 10 in gouache for reasons I'll explain later. Um, I've changed the way that I paint and oil my landscapes. They've changed over the years. You'll see when we get down to the bottom. I used to paint in a very indirect manner, um, like this painting with the pink and the painting below it. Those are paintings that were done with grisaille underpaintings, and then many layers of glazes and little opaque thin layers. It's a very different way of painting. which I don't really do anymore. Okay, and then maybe just portraits. Okay, and I used to do a lot of commission portraits. I still do. I I end up doing a lot more vintage, both, well, if you can stop one second, that painting with the um, with the shawl uh, was in the Owen Wilson paint movie. <laughs> if anybody saw it, it was called paint. It was probably in the theaters for about a week, but it, it should be on Netflix. <laughs> so if you're watching it on Netflix, watch towards the end when he goes into the museum, cause it's on about three seconds. <laughs> and the rest are just a series of portraits. I think that probably gives them a good, a All good right. review. Okay. I'll stop share and, uh, Hi everyone. <laughs> so I'll uh you're uh I made you you're gonna so you can I'm gonna share my screen right at your end, yeah. Go. Oops, why did it do that? Hold on one second. Is it are, am I sharing this right now? Uh yeah, it's your yes. email. Okay, you're in my email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so what I was thinking we would do today, and this will be a little redundant for maybe Trudy and uh, uh, Eileen, I think you've you've been through some of this as well. Um, I'm going to take a what I did, a, a color presentation that I kind of revised down. Um, our mentorship program is gonna be really helping people figure out where they wanna take their work next. And, that means for me, a lot of exploring, experimenting, kind of doing things that you haven't done before, revisiting basic concepts like color, composition, 
maybe uh, maybe looking at them in a different way. And hopefully that will help you to figure out whether you want to go in a different direction with your work. A lot of people always are concerned about maybe developing a specific personal style. Um, style will come to you naturally the more that you paint. But um, for that reason, I thought maybe we would do a, a short overview of color because color is, let me just get this open. Color is really one of those uh, qualities of a painting that will end up being associated with you. So, so there are, does anybody know who this artist is? Can anyone guess? It's Milton Avery. So he has such a specific look to his paintings. He's from the 1950s um, because of the shapes and the types of colors he uses. You can almost automatically, if you're familiar with his work, pick his work out of anywhere. Um, when I'm on Instagram, there are certain artists that I can that I can pick out immediately. I, I already know who's, who's painted it without looking at the name. Um, so color is really an important thing to understand because yet you, you have to understand it. Uh, I just need to kind of collapse because I can't read. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I've got you guys all over my, it's over my print. So I'm gonna have to get out of this. There we go. All right, so color is one of the tools that we can use to create and communicate our unique artistic statement or vision, but you need to know the language of it if you're gonna use it intentionally and effectively. So just to review for some people, uh, and please stop if you guys have got any questions where uh, Louise and I decided that and rather than using chat, we'll just have you just say if you've got any questions. Uh, there are three basic color models. The red, yellow, blue is what we as painters use. That's the color wheel that we're all familiar with. The CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black is what they use for printed media. That's what magazines use. You'll see if you buy a gouache, um, there are sets called CMYK because gouache used to be used for the illustrations used in print advertising back in the 40s and 50s mainly because it will print exactly true to the color of the painting. Um, when you, it's, it's considered a subtractive model where all the colors mixed together will create black. I don't understand that concept, but that's, that's about as far as I go with that. Uh, RGB is the red, green, blue. All those colors mixed together will create white and that's used in digital media. So like anything that you see on uh, art that's created on, your laptop or in the movies that that's based on that color model. So that's RGB versus CMYK. And that's that's really as far as I go with the, <laughs> those. <laughs> so the three properties of color are hue, which is the actual color family, meaning red, yellow, blue, chroma, how intense or how gray that color is, and value, which is how dark or light the color is. That's the three of them next to each other, but I'm going to go into them in more detail. So Hugh, this is our this is our red, yellow, blue primary color circle. It gets divided into secondaries, which is green, violet, and orange, and then tertiaries in between each of those. Chroma, you can see a highly, uh, also called saturation. There's, there's people refer to it in different ways. It can be referred to as chroma intensity saturation. A high intensity, high chroma color would be this color red up at the top. A low chroma, low saturation red would be the one at the bottom, which is almost gray. Mm -hmm. Value. So you can see here, when we talk about a high value color, it means it's very light. The, the value goes from zero to 10. So mm -hmm. a, a low value would be a dark color. So, you know, a low value of one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. To make things a little bit more complicated, everything is all relative. There's nothing, no color or value exists completely 
on its own without being affected by what's around it. So can you guys see the A and the B squares here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the A and the B, I'm sure you've probably seen this before. This is a, a pretty common um, illustration. The A and the B are the exact same value. Uh, the reason that B looks so light is because it's surrounded by dark and shadow. The reason that A looks, I mean, B looks so light because it's surrounded by dark. The A block looks dark because it's surrounded by light. So you can see how that affects the value. It also affects the color. So on the left, you've got two blocks of color that are exactly the same. The one on the left looks more green because it's surrounded by the pink, which is its complement. The one on the right looks much lighter because it's surrounded by a darker color. So this is a great exercise to do on your own in your sketchbooks. I did this for a student. The bottom four squares are all exactly the same, same value, same color blue. But then I surrounded it. This is a gouache uh, mm -hmm. exercise. The one on the left, I surrounded it with a darker blue, so it looks more green. Next to it, that green makes it look more blue. Those are both exactly the same color in the middle. And then on the right, uh, the right-hand side, you can see the lighter blue makes it look dark. The one on the very end, if it was more orange, it would really pop. You would kind of see a, like a little reverberation. Um, that's when you know that you've got a complete complementary contrast going. That was that was not a complete contrast. So how do we put this very simple color theory into practice and start to really learn? The first thing to really do, and this is what I encourage everyone who's taken a class with me, is to start to identify colors properly. The rest of it I'll go through as we go through the, the slides. So when you look at this slide, does anybody want to tell me what the one on the right is? Louise already did this. <laughs> What color is that picture? Lavender. Right. So lavender is not on the color wheel. But you're right. It is that family. But it's hard for you to mix the color lavender. The way that you're going to mix that color is to say it's in the red-violet family. To me, it looks red-violet to me. Um, is it light or dark? It's kind of mid-value, right? it's not really, really light. It's not really, really dark. What, how intense is it? Is it a, like a really vibrant red violet or is it a really, really grayed down red violet? Gray it's down. Down. Yeah, it's more grayed down. It's definitely yeah. not, it's not a total gray, but it's definitely on the lower chroma. So if you were using oil or acrylic paint, you now have the the steps to mix this color. You know it's red violet. If you've only got three colors on your palette, you know you're gonna mix your, your red and your blue. That's gonna be a really dark color. So you know you're gonna have to add white. That's probably gonna be a really blown out color. So you know you're gonna have to add some blue and some red back in. And then to gray it down, you need to add the complement. The complement of violet is yellow. So if you can identify the colors properly, in terms of its actual hue on the color wheel, its its value and its saturation level, you can mix it much easier. I, I, I'm not before any, but does anybody have any questions on that? Yeah, I do. Um, is that a rule across the board that to gray a color down, you add its complement? Yes. I it yes, it is. Okay. What were you What were you going to say? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. I was going to. I would probably would have thought to add a little black to it. Actually. You can add black, but black will kill your color. Um, and that's an exercise that we will do in the, in the program. I will show you how different a color mixed with its complement, grayed down with its complement, looks next to a color grayed down with black. Great. Now, that's not to say that black is not a useful color. I, I use black. Um, is Does everybody know what the Zorn palette is? No. Okay, uh, Anders Zorn was a very famous painter uh, around the same time as Sargent, uh, and he was famous for using three colors. That's It's turned out that that's not really true, but it's what everybody calls the Zorn palette, which is a cadmium red medium, yellow ochre, and black. And when you see the paintings that he's done with just those three colors, 
it is amazing how much flesh tone it's really perfect for flesh tones it's a perfect portrait palette because the black in this case acts as a blue so that's where black can be very useful um i don't use it at all in um landscape painting but we will that's something that wendy we will definitely be going over that so one, another way to actually learn your colors, start, aside from starting to identify them properly, is to do color charts. Does everybody know who Richard Schmidt is? No. Yes. He, was, he, he was, he died a few years ago. He um, was the head of the Putney Painters. He was considered one of the finest realist painters in the States. And his book, Alla Prima, is kind of like the Bible of realist painting. And he has a whole section on doing color charts. And if you do them the way that he says, they'll take you a few months. <laughs> and they're very painful. <laughs> they're very painful to do. <laughs> but you will learn a tremendous amount. Uh, the way that he suggests is that you take every single color that you have on your palette and you do one chart and you mix that single color with every other color. That's what those columns are on the left. And then you mix white into it so that you get the full range of tints that you can get with those colors. I prefer doing um, a shorthand kind of color chart, which is the one on the right. And that's where you pick three colors that you might want to use for a painting. And you use you just use those three colors. And so what you'll see on the top is each of the three colors mixed with one other color in different proportions. So in that first section, you see cad yellow lemon. The uh, column next to it is two parts of cad yellow lemon mixed with one part alizarin crimson, and then with white all the way down. Uh, the next column is equal parts, cad yellow lemon and alizarin crimson, and then with white. And then the last column is one part cad yellow lemon, two parts alizarin. So you do that for each of the three colors, and by the end, you will have mixed every combination that you could of those three colors. So you mean three, three primary colors, right? No, so there's, but they don't have to be primaries. I mean, okay. I use this, if I'm looking at three different colors I want to try on a painting, I'll do a real brief thing like this. I won't spend a huge amount of time, but I'll do a, a like a shorthand just to see how those three colors react together. Um, the bottom part is where you take those top columns and you add just a little bit of the third color. So I know it sounds a little complicated, but in that first column, you see cad yellow lemon. If you add a little bit of blue to it, it, it obviously comes out green. But in the next column where you have cad yellow lemon and alizarin, you have a little bit of a violet. And when you add that, that yellow, which is its complement, you start to get grays. So those bottom ones are all the, the neutrals that you can mix from those top colors. So it's a it's a really it's an easier way to do these these color charts, and I think a little bit more useful. Like if you're starting a painting and you want to say, you know, what is how would cobalt and uh, alizarin crimson and Indian yellow look together? This is a way that you can do it and kind of get a, an idea. So Eden, every yeah. every item on that chart on the right is just from those three colors. Yes. Yes, it is just those three colors. Thank you. Now, this is an, um, an exercise that we will be doing at some point in the uh, mentoring program. This is a color translation of a master artist's painting. It's not a master copy. It is a color translation. Uh, the painting on the right is Gauguin, and the, the little copy on the left is something that I did in gouache. And I actually like to do these kind of things where you use a different medium to do um, a master copy because you really have to think about there. I obviously didn't get the exact color of what he has in that right-hand painting, but what I do have are the relationships. I want to see how those relationships work. So I got approximately where I could with gouache. I'm never going to be able to get the exact same color in oil as I am in gouache, but I, I did pretty much match the relationship. Um, maybe a little oversaturated in the oranges. I would have brought those down. It could be the camera too, the photo. Uh, for some reason, iPhones really blow out orange. Um, 
So, but at the end, I put these, the colors that um, I ended up using down at the bottom so I can use those for, for future reference, which I'll show you in the, another slide. But this is a fun little exercise and it shouldn't take you very long. I mean, this is something you could do like in an hour and you learn a lot. You really learn a lot just from, just from looking to see, you know, how grayed down do they make these colors, which is one of the things I always am amazed when you go and do a master copy, how much they mix those colors down into, into neutrals. They're, most of them are not very saturated. So, so it's a really interesting um, exercise. So how and, do you start out with that, Eden? Do you, do you try to kind of pick out the basic colors that you think are in there and then- Yes, limit yes. It to those? Yeah. Yes, I would look like I looked at I looked at that painting, uh, and I thought it's it's a very dark, cool, neutral, right? The background. Mm -hmm. So you don't have very many choices for cool neutrals on a palette, whether it's acrylic or oil. So I started off with ultramarine. If you add a little bit of burnt sienna in there. Or, or what I it looks like I used here was a mix of um, maybe alizarin and yellow ochre, that which makes an orange, which is what burnt sienna is. Um, that'll give you a gray if you add a touch of white to it. So I probably started there. From the looks of it, I didn't go far enough. It's probably a little too blue. But um, you know, I mean, these are these are just studies to right. kind of get you started. But you limited it to five. Yes. Colors, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another thing that I'm very big on is using black and white references. The the um, painting on the left is actually a black and white photo of my grandmother. And I decided I would just use a complementary palette of violet and yellow. And that's all that's that's there. I may have used a darker Payne's gray or something to get that really dark um, dress. And so it's totally arbitrary. I could have used any color. I was just matching the values in the black and white reference. Similarly, on the right, that is a still shot from a black and white movie that I had on my laptop. I just took a screenshot of it. It's Yvonne DiCarlo. <laughs> <Anybody>? <laughs> and it's, again, um, I used a violet, yellow, green palette. Um, I mean, I love doing these kind of things. I think they're kind of fun. But you... Effect, yeah. So this is an example of how I bring this all together. So the painting on the left is a color translation of a Vuillard painting. The painting of on the what? right of a oh, Vuillard. Oh. Thank you. Uh, the painting on the right is a black and white photo of my grandmother and my father as a baby that I've always loved. I've always loved this photo. So I took the palette generally. I mean, I, I obviously adapted it with that brighter green and applied it to this photo. And that's how I ended up with this painting on the right, which I actually quite liked. And it got into a Vermont watercolor show. So again, if you if you do pastels, Trudy, this is one of your uh, exercises that we did. Yep. Um, I'm a big proponent of limiting your palette. I'm sure you've heard that from, from other teachers is the best way to learn color and to control color in a painting is to use fewer colors uh, and experiments, small little experiments. It will really get you a long way in understanding how your materials work. So on the left, you can see there's some little pastel thumbnails um, on the right, it's the same principle. I just use different uh, combinations. The left, the left hand one is, I think, oh, I think this has a second layer on it, so you can't really see the underpainting. But the left hand one was a warm underpainting. The middle one was a cool underpainting, and the one on the right was complementary. And sketchbooks. This is where we do a lot of the exploration and exercises and just exploring and, you know, coming up with ideas. I'm going to show you some of my, uh, just a few pages of my sketchbooks at the end. And um, that's some of the stuff we'll be covering. What type of sketchbook do you rec recommend for gouache? Um, 
Well, hold on. Let's, let me uh, let me get rid of that. Uh, you know what? I will let me tell you that at the end because I'm going to go over that when I show everything. <laughs> Is that all right? Sure. I'll, I'll tell you the different types of sketchbooks because right now I'm going to go into the gouache demo. Should we do that? Sure. Yep. All right. So there's no narration on this um, movie. This is about 20, there we go. Yeah, it's 23 minutes. So we can speed it up if people can. <laughs> um, I will just talk through it. You guys can ask questions as we go. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure, Wendy and Eileen, have you seen this before or uh, Trudy and Eileen? I don't know what you're going to do exactly, but it seems like maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. This is, this is a, a demo that I did. Um, I think it must've been a zoom class that we were doing for one of the art societies. This I did just to kind of show people how I start a gouache uh, study or painting I use the gouache very, very thin, and I almost always uh, tint the paper because that's the way that I paint in oil. I I really don't like painting on a um, white surface. It's very hard to get, um, particularly in like in pastel and in your early stages with gouache, it's hard to kind of judge values when you're working on a stark white piece of paper. Um, so I, even if it's not like a bright orange, which I'm doing this because I'm doing a landscape when I have a lot of green, I like to put something a little complimentary underneath it. Uh, so that it, it warms it up a little bit. Ordinarily, if I was doing an oil painting and it was a cityscape, I might do like a, a very thin violet or, um, if it's like a rainy day, a lizard. But nothing really, really bright. I usually do a, a, a kind of a subdued, just to kill the white. They call it, kill it the white, kill the white. So I'm trying to decide what to do here. <laughs> this is a, a painting that is of an alleyway behind my gallery here. I guess I should have had the picture. You guys are not going to know what I'm doing here. I totally forgot to include the picture of the, the reference photo. It's a, it's a trees in the back with a white building and a foreground uh, with wildflowers. So once the uh, once the orange is dry, the the basic, it's actually called an imp imprimatur imprimatura, which is just kind of the the single color that goes on your first layer. I'm still keeping the paint really thin here. It's not overly runny, but it's it's not, um, as I move through the painting, there'll be less and less water in the paint. So you can see how I have my gouache set up here. This is the same way I set up my oil paints. I use the same, pretty much the same palette, no matter what medium I'm using. So if you'll see, I'm using, um, for these background, I usually like to use different, uh, like towards where it's gonna be warmer, I'll add a little bit of burnt sienna into that green. Where it's gonna be cooler, I might use a little bit of violet for the deeper colors. If anybody has questions, please just let me know. So Eden, I notice you're wearing gloves. You know, I think the reason I was wearing gloves that day is because I had thumb surgery. <laughs> I had a, I had a big bandaid on my thumb, so I think that's oh. why I had a, I had the gloves on. It is a good idea to use gloves. It really is. Um, particularly in oils, I do try to wear gloves when I'm painting an oil because I like to use lead white. Mm -hmm. and um it is good not to get that stuff on your hands it's not so much um getting it on your hands as as you know i mean if you're anything like me i'm covered in 
whatever I'm painting with by the end of the day. So. <clears throat> Pastels are not so bad, but the problem with pastels are that you've got to be careful not to inhale mm -hmm. the dust. Mm. Okay. And uh, it's a bigger problem than people realize, I think. Um, there is a there is a thing that you can put on your easel. It's very expensive, unfortunately, but um, it's like an HVAC vacuum that you put at oh. the bottom of the easel. But another way of handling that is to always make sure there's tape underneath your, your paper or foil so that it's not just floating out into the floor. And, well, I mean, it, it. I painted solely in pastel for many years, close to 10 years. I only painted in pastel. And so when we were in the Caribbean, almost all of my paintings were pastel. And the first boat that we were on had a little little side room that didn't have a window. And after I'd been in that room for a couple of years, <laughs> I, went, <laughs> I went to clean it out. And I mean, I could not believe how much pastel was on, was on the walls. It was, I mean, you just don't realize how much dust mm -hmm. gets created um, with these pastels. So I, the reason I also like orange for a, a landscape is that I like seeing a, those little bits of orange coming through the sky yeah, that's great. and a little bit through, through the, uh, the green in the foreground. So how many layers would you say you end up with usually in the end? It really varies. I would say, you know, it can be anywhere from four to like 12. Oh. One of the things with one of the things with gouache is that the lights dry darker and the darks dry lighter. Mm. And no matter how light you think you've made that sky, you'll come back in the morning and it'll be three shades darker. Mm -hmm. So quite often I will go back in and really just like lay on two or three more layers of light to get to get a light sky. Um, but when you say layers, remember one of the one of the keys to doing really nice layering in any medium is making sure that the previous layer comes through so a layer may only be a few a few marks right mm -hmm. um i find that you see how that looks in the the lower left there's a nice brushiness to that that you don't really want to cover up um, I think you'll see when I get to the end, I do put some marks on it to indicate foliage, but being able to see kind of through that transparent to the, to the underpainting is a nice um, technique. Um, one that you'll see in a lot of really good oil painters who do really nice landscapes. You'll see very transparent areas that just have a couple layers on it and then some really thick areas. So it's that kind of contrast between thick and thin. Right. That ends that gives you some visual interest, which is hard to do in a water media because you're not going to get impasto with gouache. Or you shouldn't, because if you have impasto, it's going to crack. Can you get it with acrylics? Yes, I think you can. Um, there is now see, I'm not as I just actually have started fooling around with acrylics. It would be the same. Principle though with acrylics there are meat there are um, additives that mm -hmm. you can add that will give it more body and so yes you can build up more impasto with the acrylics. Who asked that question? Eileen. Eileen, as I can only see two of you right now. I can sure. only see you. <laughs> and, <laughs> you can't see. Wait, doing. you can't see the screen? No, I see. I see the uh, the the, the, the 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 video. Yeah. Okay. And All you. Right. Okay. Oh, you Is can't see anybody else. So go no. to the top and and click the squares. Uh, I don't have gallery view available while you're showing this. I don't think. Usually, oh, you I should, you should. I, I think oh, you I should. spotlighted you so for the recording. Uh, so maybe I, I'm not sure. I can. I can. No, I can. You. I can see you it's guys. It's okay. It's yeah. okay. It's all right. So when you're not doing this, I can see everybody. Okay. All right. So you see how now I'm mixing. I'm mixing into the same colors. I'm using yeah. I'm using the puddles to mix variations on those greens in the background. 
you have to make sure whatever's underneath is fully dry or you, um you know. well the the gouache is uh reactivated by yeah. wet so um not really I mean, you can get kind of watercolor types effects if you want it wet. You can kind of control the type of effects that you want. The only thing you can't do is take a dry area. See like what I'm doing right there. You see that that paint is not really that wet. See, I'm always dabbing the brush on mm -hmm. that paper towel mm -hmm. because I can see right now that paint's too wet and I'm probably gonna have to dab it a little bit. Um. Just like an oil painting, if you've got wet oil paint, you've got to lay it on, you've got to lay it on gently so that you're not bringing up uh, the previous layer in gouache. Now with acrylic gouache, it doesn't matter. And with acrylic, because it dries immediately and you can't lift it up again. There's acrylic gouache? Yes, it's called acryl gouache. Uh, and it's made by um, Holbein, I think. Okay. And, yeah, hold on. There's different companies now that make it actually. No. Yeah, there are a few. I think Turner is another one. Um, so the difference between acrylic gouache and acrylic is that acrylic gouache dries matte like gouache. Okay. The difference between acrylic gouache and gouache is that acrylic gouache behaves like acrylic. It it dries it dries immediately and it can't be lifted up again. Mm -hmm. So you can see that I, I'm using the puddle method of getting different different variations of basically the same value green. Now, the one thing I'm not doing is going in there once that puddle is dry, which it will be in about 30 seconds, and just adding water onto it to break. I'm always adding more color onto it because if you try to, to just take a wet brush and bring up dried paint from your palette, you're just going to create a hole in your painting because it's just going to dissolve what's there. Mm -hmm. You guys understand what I'm saying? You um, need to always have fresh paint mixing on top of it. When you're working on a palette like this, you need to have fresh paint mixed in. You can't use a dried puddle of paint with water. If the palette dries up, can you revive it? Uh... No, that's what I'm saying. No, you, you, you can mix fresh color on top of it. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to ever want to go in with just a wet brush and try to try to pick up dried color, right? Because it won't be strong enough. Did I just miss what somebody said? So if you don't use your palette for a while, it can dry up on you, right? Oh, it will. It'll dry up in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why also you see that there's a spray bottle there. See the blue spray bottle next to the water? Mm. I will spray it every few minutes, every probably every five to 10 minutes. A very light mist. I didn't realize how much the uh, table was shaking. <laughs> so I'll fix that for future future demos. It's not that bad. <clears throat> how long i mean i you know i could maybe have looked at my own clock but is this real time or yeah this is real time <clears throat> and about how long because i haven't seen you use the spray bottle so i was thinking has, oh has okay it... well i probably <clears throat> sprayed it right before we started painting okay. um so i would say probably about 10 minutes you can tell by you see the paint you see how you can see the uh the reflections Mm -hmm. That means yes. it's still, it means it's still wet enough. Yeah. Okay. It's when you start seeing a dull kind of sheen on it that you know that you've got to spray the paint. And and when you take the brush to the water, it's just to get it off the brush. You're so really not ever bringing the water to the. No, paint. I never ever take water directly. Without kind of dabbing, I usually don't without dabbing it on either the paper towel. I, I don't ever take a wet brush that's sopping wet to the painting for sure. Um, I also try to control how much water is going when I'm picking up the paint. Yeah. Because if you keep adding water, you're gonna dilute the surface of the paint and it'll yep. be hard to control. Um, I'm also, if you see, I'm pick, I'm taking the color from the very edges of, of the wells. 
because that way I yes. can. Um, oh, actually, I do. I do actually. In a few minutes, I will. Um, I will spray the paint. I remember now. Okay. And aren't you taking it from the edge of the well so that you don't contaminate the entire? Yes, so I don't contaminate the rest of the paint. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that way it's easier to kind of clean it up when you, you know, about halfway through. These decisions you're making about the greens that you're applying here at the edges, the, in right. the inside edges, are, are you making those decisions based on what you're seeing on your photograph? Or that's a good question. That's a very good question. And um, not so much. I'm looking when I'm looking at the photograph, I'm sorry, but I don't have the photograph. I will show you the finished paintings when, when they're done here. Um, I'm looking at the photograph for like in the foreground, there might be little patches of where there's dark kind of in between the plants. Mm -hmm. I might be looking for that kind of a pattern. I'm not trying to copy it. I'm trying to suggest it. Yep. Uh, let me just, you see how it, that is, that's called a scumbling where you're just yeah. trying to, you're kind of leaving a textured. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. That you do with a, a fairly dry brush. You see, I have it, I've taken a lot of the water off that brush. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get a scumble. And Wendy, that's, that is a Payne's gray that I'm, I'm dipping into there. It's not black. Okay. I, yeah, um, Payne's gray is a much, uh, it's almost a blue. Mm -hmm. It's a very grayed down blue. It's a very handy um, mm -hmm. mixing color, particularly for landscapes. So there are paintings that you can do with just layers and layers of scumbling, and you'll get this really rich kind of mosaic of colors popping through. Um, if anybody, I can't remember who I've shown this to, but there's an artist on Instagram called Mike Hernandez. His handle is uh, Squatch Gouache. Oh, but he is a phenomenal painter and he's uh, he does a really unique way of of gouache with, with, he uses like kind of loaded brushes, but he scumbles a lot. So they're, they're very textured. Um, he works for Pixar. He teaches out in California. I think I follow him. I yeah, you probably do. He's a wonderful painter. <laughs> yeah, he's, I've been following him for a long time. Yeah, um, amazing. Yeah. He, uh, a lot of these young digital painters use gouache because you can kind of get a very similar effect which is kind of funny, right? I mean, this is such an old medium. Gouache has really had a comeback. It was it was very popular in the 40s and 50s, and then it kind of went away for a long time. And now everybody's everybody's playing with gouache. Sorry for the shaking there. I'll fix that in the future. Let's see where we are here. So there's about six minutes left here. And um, I actually think I, I end this right before I start to put the wildflowers in. So I'll, I'll show you how it looks right. at, the, at the end. Time constraints. But uh, but you see that as, we, as I've proceeded here, I'm using, well, not there. I'm using more water, but see how, see how thick that, or, or how solid that line came out because there was yeah. water, so much water on the brush. That's the difference that you get in the texture of the paint. Um, how many different brushes do you use usually in the painting? So you see on the left-hand side, those are actually the brushes that I use most. Um, I think they're all Princeton. I probably only use two or three brushes. I like flats. Mm -hmm. um, I use a big wash brush for the beginning and then mostly flats. And then I try not to get into really small detail brushes, but the, um, the Princeton Velvet Touch brushes are perfect for gouache. Those are nice brushes. And then those blue ones are flats and they're, I think they're called one stroke. 
And I, I forgot what the name of that yellow and orange brush is, but it's also a Princeton brush. They're all synthetics. You don't want to use watercolor brushes for gouache. So Louise, you, you paint in acrylics, right? Yeah, acrylics and watercolor and a bit and of watercolor. And what kind of acrylic? What's the brand acrylics that you have? Um, I have a whole mix of brands. Mm -hmm. um, golden is probably the Okay, so yeah, so golden heavy body. Uh I I use all all oh, okay. kinds. like I use the center ones too. Yeah, they you know they've come a long way. It used to be yeah. that acrylic paints were were really they looked very plastic. And they've really, really improved the quality of them in the last few years. Oh, for sure. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between an acrylic yeah. and a painting now, you know, if it's well done. Right? Yeah. If anybody follows Scott Christensen, does everybody know who he is? No. He's a he's he's probably considered one of the best landscape painters in the country. He's out west, and um, he does. I mean, he does. It's you can tell a master painter when you can't tell the difference between any of the mediums that they're using. I mean, they they all look. I mean, he does these huge, huge landscapes from out west, but he uses gouache and acrylic for his smaller paintings, and they're really beautiful. I highly recommend following him on Instagram if you. What was that name again? Scott Christensen. So you see how much that color faded, the the sky faded from that first. Uh... Yeah. Mm. Uh, Eden, why don't you use watercolor brushes for gouache? Because watercolor brushes are very soft and gouache has, there we go. See, I, I knew I had to spray. <laughs> Yay. So was it Eileen who asked about, it looks like in about 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get a stopwatch. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but the last question just went completely out of my head. Uh, you were saying watercolor brushes are too soft. Watercolor brushes gouache. because the gouache has got a lot of body. And so okay. um, you need to have a little bit of firmness in the brush to be able to pick up the paint. You can use a watercolor brush for the first wash, but you don't want to be using it at this stage where you want the paint a little bit thicker. You wouldn't want to go between the two mediums with the same brushes either. That's it kind of the opaque. Yeah, I, I have point. discovered that I'm trying to keep uh, the acrylic brushes and the gouache brush brushes separate because the acrylic brushes still leave, they leave a film, even if you wash them right away. So, um, yeah, you should keep your brushes separate, I think, in my opinion. Or maybe it's just because I don't clean them well enough. <laughs> Probably a good idea. Looking for somewhere to, looking for a space. Mm -hmm. so we're almost done with this. This is almost to the end. And I'll show you how it, it ended up. But you see, um, I don't do too much more to that bottom left right here because <clears throat> I like the way that it's kind of that transparent is kind of interacting with the the different opaque strokes. It's and it's suggesting foliage rather than or or grass rather than actually depicting it. <clears throat> For some reason we ended this like right right in the I think we had a time limit. So this will be it. Say two. <laughs> so the only thing that goes goes on from here is that I add in the wildflowers. Uh, which I will show you right here. Mm. This is what it, so I went back in, but you see, I still left a Lights. lot of transparent. Yep. And then I just went in with very thick little dabs of those bright colors. 
right? But everything else is pretty much the same as what I just did in the demo. Um, here I did, it looks like I did do a little scumbling over that back bush mm -hmm. to push it back so that there was a little bit more depth back there. And then this was just a six by eight study. I then used that to do the oil painting, which is this one. So this one I did with an acrylic underpainting. So those violets are the acrylic and then went over it with oil. So that's a 16 by 20 painting. So what do you establish by doing the study that helps you in the oil? Well, first I, if the composition works, um, that's the primary thing. Uh, if it looks good small, it should look good big. That said, there are other challenges to taking something small and, you know, something that looks good with just one little stroke needs to be a little bit more fleshed out when it's going to be an 18 by 24 painting. Um, but I get an idea of what it would look like as a big painting. And, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of investment to do a 20 by 30 or even an 18 by 24 painting with oil. I mean, you're, it's the cost of the linen and the paint and the time that it takes for it to dry. So if, if I do a study and I say, you know, it doesn't really grab me, it doesn't really interest me, or <laughs> I don't like it in these colors, maybe I'll try it in a different colors. It'll mm -hmm. save me a lot of time and effort when I go to do the bigger painting. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Sure. All right, so let me just finish up here with, um, I'm gonna show you a couple of my sketchbooks real briefly. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, so you need to highlight, spotlight this, the Eden Compton. Okay. So uh, Louise was asking what type of sketchbooks, can everybody see this now? What a, I I'm seeing a paint a painting of a. Oh, people. that's my grandfather's painting. Take off my Eden. Oh, you... I need to stop sharing. Right, stop sharing. Okay. Stop sharing. <laughs> stop sharing. You're sharing oh. too much. <laughs> we should see you in the sketchbook. Okay, so now you're gonna spot. You're gonna spotlight the. Um... Yes. You're. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So these are uh, the pentallic watercolor uh, sketchbooks, mm -hmm. and these have turned out to be my favorite ones, um, mainly because the paper is nice and thick, and uh, it's got just enough pages. So I do a lot of my work in these sketchbooks. Um, these are, I do both from life and from reference photos, just exploring whether I want to do a, a big painting of it or not. This was uh, just a painting out my window. But these were life paintings in the park, which I will do. There's the little Vuillard painting. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you can see I, how I use it for, there's another Vuillard color study. Beautiful. And from a reference photo, just kind of trying out different different approaches to, um, I have a lot of main paintings from when we used to sail. Um, again, same same idea of, is, can everybody see those clearly? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on one second. I had this bookmarked for some reason. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, this is this is a color study I did of a Florida landscape. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time in Florida. The reason that I did that is because I actually worked just from a sketch that I had done of it in 2016. <laughs> um, so this is something that I like to do a lot. I'll I'll go back through my sketchbooks where I've, I've done a lot of, I mean, I used to do a lot of sketching. I would sketch every day. So I have tons of these sketchbooks, just shapes, shapes of trees. Um, these are all Newport, Rhode Island. 
but sketching is a a great if if you don't have time to get your paints out have a sketchbook with a pencil in your purse all the time so that you can capture capture shapes capture ideas so that little uh I actually used this this uh, drawing to do that little wash study, and I kind of like it because I like the the uh, kind of contemporary feel of it. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, so again, I use these for. Uh, this is a painting idea. This was actually my nephew's that ended up being a big painting. These are like sometimes I'm just sitting in the studio and I'll just paint out the window. Uh, I just use these for to explore different ideas. I had flowers in the studio. Uh, a lot of times I will use these to explore different color palettes. That's well, yeah, a, I was wondering, how do you keep track of what colors you used in those studies? Then I don't, I don't see the little swatches on there. So the, I don't I don't need the swatches now because I know because I know. use the same <laughs> color. I use the same colors. Um, that's one advantage I use. Um, I did a larger painting of this for the landscape show this year. Eileen, did you go to that? No, uh, show? no. Um, Where this, was it? I, yeah, uh, out in Cambridge, New York. It's a. I missed it. Here's a little color temperature study that I did. You know, warmer versus cooler. I mean, I do these kind of little exercises all the time. If I haven't, if I'm not working on a painting or I want a break, I'll just fool around with something. This, I wanted to see how wow. bright could I go as an underpainting. <laughs> Eden, the question that, that, that I guess Louise just asked, it, uh, you said that you don't have to denote what, uh, what, paints you used because you always use did you say you always use the same yes the same I use oh. I basically use what's called a split complementary palette with earth colors that means I have a warm and a cool of red yellow and blue with an earth color of each of those so my oil painting palette is alizarin crimson and either cad red medium or some some cad red um, if it's a more, if, if the, if it looks like I've used like a more orange type of red, then it was probably, um, like a pyrrole red or something, uh, for the blue, I always have ultramarine and usually cobalt blue. And then for the yellow, I either have a cad yellow lemon and a cad yellow medium. And then the earth color versions of those would be for the yellow, yellow ochre for the red, uh, transparent red oxide. And for the blue, paints gray. Those are earth variations of those three primaries. That is my standard palette. For many years, many years, uh, I only painted with four colors in oil painting. And that was burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, uh, yellow ochre, and alizarin crimson. So, you know, it, it, Limiting your palette does not mean that you're limiting your choices because if you've got if you've got uh, three good colors, you can mix any color with with those primaries plus white. Thank you. A little gray helps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, is an it, exercise that I I'm sure that some of you have seen. This is 20 minute sketches. Um, I started this during, I think probably during the pandemic. I just, I just gritted this off in a, in a big sketchbook. This was, uh, oh God, a wolf con. This is a very old sketchbook. Um, these are gouache. I just sketched it off and I gave myself 20 minutes to paint whatever was around me. And so it's a great way to just make yourself make a choice, get the colors down and you know, do it fast. And three hours went by very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> That's three hours worth. <laughs> well, no, this was every day. These are different days. These oh, are different okay, because it's like 20, 20. So yeah, so they yeah 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> Great. So um, same thing, you can, do it, you can do it with photo references too. If you don't want to paint from life, these are all different photos where I just said, what's, what's the least amount of information that I can put down in 20 minutes? 
Mm. So that's what these are based on different reference photos. So even so those are some of the things we'll be we can expect. Yes. These yeah. are some of the exercises we'll be doing based on what people want to do. I'm going to turn this off because it's distracting. Um, you know, as everybody, I know Eileen, you posted a couple of things uh, on the chat. As people do, uh, one of the things that I ask people who are going to join the mentoring program is to do a self-assessment questionnaire, which is to look at your body of work, pick out the things that you really like about your work, um, really think about what you want to what you want to accomplish because I will adjust whatever you want to whatever you need to get in that direction is how we will tailor these exercises um, and cover things that, that every, that will benefit everybody. I mean, everybody can benefit from studying color and composition and design. I mean, that's just something that I'm still learning. Everybody's still learning. You learn it. I mean, I think it was either Matisse or Monet. I'm not sure which one who, when he, right before he died said, I was just understanding it. <laughs> just now understanding it <laughs> you learn for the rest of your life i mean so it's uh it's a work in progress for everybody oh you know, i think we're over we're done now already now so. i gotta go to another meeting oh are there any final <laughs> questions or i i had like this might be a silly question but is there ever a danger with the gouache especially as you do more layers and, and it gets thick does it ever um crack or flake yes. Yes, I haven't had that problem because I haven't done it that thick, but um I it it I have read and I have seen um examples of where you can't do impasto like you do in oil or acrylic. Okay. Because particularly since most of the time you're painting on paper and the flexibility yeah. of the paper is going to crack it. That's that's what I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh there's something that I will show people in the program. I I tend to mount uh, for the for the little gouache studies that I keep and that I sell, uh, I mount the the paper on to a hardboard, mm. and then I uh, cold wax it hmm. so that it still has the cool. matte look, but it is sealed and therefore can't be damaged by water, and you don't have to put glass on it. Oh, nice idea! Oh, wow, that's great! I yeah, yeah, thank you. And plus, it'll prevent any cracking if you've got it on a rigid surface. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about that as you're flipping through the books. I thought, oh, that's so flexible. As oh, you yeah, say, no, but those, I... are, those are thin <laughs> enough that they're fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and plus, those the uh, those the watercolor, the pentallic watercolor books are good because the paper is very very thick. Nice. Great. This was wonderful. Thank you. Great. Right, well, thank you guys well, for coming. Yeah. I hope thank, I you. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Wonderful presentation and demo. And I okay, can't... well, I look forward to starting next week. Yeah, me it's too. Exciting. Thank you. All this. Oh, uh, <clears throat> It'll be fun. And anybody who wants more information on Masteries, just go on masteries.com. Uh, you'll find everything there. And I hope this inspired you to give mentorship a try. So that's right. it for today. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Louisa. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.